and loud.
Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Hey, Hare Krishna, Hare. Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram, Hare Hare. Bolo, turn up the volume. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Hey, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Krishna, Ito. Hey. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna. Nithai Gaur Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna, Nithai Gaur, Nithai Gaur, Nithai Gaur, Hari Bhav, Hari Bhav, Hari Bhav, Gaur, Hari Bhav, Jai Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Jai Pancha Tadva. Jai Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Sri Prabhu Pada. Prabhu Pan, Prabhu Pan, Prabhu Pan, Jai Prabhu Pan. Prabhu Pan. Oh, Pagalandi, Hari 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 Bo, Shira Prabhu Pan Ki. Hari Ram, Shankirtan Ki Jai. Maum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimakti Bhakti Viranta Swami, Tinamini Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gorbani Pracharine Nivarsisa Sunyavari Pasyatyare Satarine, Anchakalpa, Thurubhischa, Kripa Sindhu, Bhavacha, Patitanam, Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavebhyo, Namahona Maha, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasari Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, in uh, preface to the big, one of the biggest holidays of the year, which is... Uh, same time as the Christians celebrate their holiday. Of course, they welcome their pure devotee, <laughs> incarnation of 
the Lord as Shaktivesh avatar, as Prabhupada said, Lord Jesus Christ. Prabhupada said we call him Lord Jesus Christ because he is very dear to everyone. And he is a manifestation of the energy of the Lord to preach uh, religious principles according to time, place, and candidate. And uh, so on the 25th, which is a few days, we will also be honoring the speaking of the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Sri Krishna himself. So these two days, people around the world are preparing in different ways to celebrate the Lord, this is the Lord's pure devotee, like that. So we, uh, we want to maybe preface our uh, appearance of Krishna speaking the Bhagavad Gita by speaking a little bit of some of the points of Gita. Um, I decided tonight maybe we can read a few verses from the introduction, which includes the Gita Mahatmya. And uh, so in this Gita Mahatmya, there's some interesting statements that are being made. But before I do that, I just want to kind of like narrate one little particular pastime, which is really quite interesting. It's quite fundamental to the whole uh, story of the Bhagavad Gita. After it was decided that there was no other recourse but to have war in order to decide who would sit on the throne. You had the same family divided amongst themselves, the Kurus and the Pandavas, both cousin brothers. Uh, they all had, they had uh, similar fathers, similar uncles, friends. Very united family. I mean, at least very big family, all Kshatriyas. And now there is a contention over the throne. Pandu, Pandu was supposed to sit on the throne, but Pandu died an untimely death at a young age. And therefore, his sons, the Pandavas, headed by Yudhisthira, who was the oldest, was supposed to take the throne. But Dhritarashtra stepped in and said, because he is the older brother of Pandu, his sons should be on it. Because he, he said he was meant to take the throne, but because he couldn't, he was blind, he couldn't take the throne, so therefore his son should have it. But Dhritarashtra was off, and therefore, but he made this trouble, so the trouble brewed into having these sons who were very avaricious and gr greedy for power, headed by Duryodhana. So now we have an attention, a very uh, intense, uh, contentious uh, situation. And in that situation, we find there was a lot of intrigue to destroy the Pandavas, and, but none of these works because Krishna protected them from the house of lack, from the poison cake, from so many differences from the time in, in the jungle that they had to spend 13 years in, the, in exile, and that one year that they had to spend incognito if they were discovered during that time, then they would have to spend another 13 years. So it was a very difficult time. And now the war has been decided. There's no other recourse. Everything, Krishna tried to make peace, but it didn't work. Diodhana didn't want to compromise anything. He wanted every piece of land as his a ruling kingdom. He wouldn't even give the pond of his five villages. <laughs> and so war was inevitable. Oh, who's this? Welcome. What's your name? <laughs> Thank you for coming. We have Prashadam, so don't worry. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there was no other recourse at this point when Krishna tried his best. But everyone understood the power of Krishna. Krishna had an army called Narayan Sena, Narayani Sena, a very powerful army, and he was the head of that army. So Duryodhana and Arjuna wanted to get Krishna on, his, on their side during this war. So they all decided to meet Krishna. 
So Duryodhana thought, if I get to Krishna first, then I'll have, I'll be able to get Krishna on my side. <clears throat> so he came to the place where Krishna was resting. Krishna was sleeping at the time, and uh, Arjuna also came. But when Duryodhana arrived, Krishna was asleep. So he stood next to Krishna by his head, waiting for Krishna to wake up. But Arjuna arrived at the same time when Krishna was sleeping. He stood at Krishna's feet. And when Krishna opened his eyes, the first person he saw was Arjuna, not Duryodhana. So then, there was a... Krishna said, well, actually, um, you can have either me or my armies. And so I'm going to give the first choice to Arjuna because Arjuna was the first person I saw. Duryodhana said, no, no, that's not fair. I came first. Krishna said, no. I saw him first, therefore he gets the first choice. So Arjuna understood Krishna and Krishna's power. And so, and Krishna also said uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not going to fight. I'll just be there as a well-wisher on whatever side I'm on. My armies will be on one side and I'll be on the other side. So Arjuna understood Krishna and he was glorified Krishna and said, just by having you on our side, everything is successful. So he decided to take our Krishna. And Duryodhana was so happy. He was thinking, wow, Arjuna, he's so foolish. He could have took all these powerful soldiers to have, but he didn't. He decided to take uh, Krishna. And Duryodhana was really happy to get all of Krishna's powerful army. So, of course, then of Krishna. But then Arjuna started to talk to Krishna after Duryodhana left and said that, you know, you, uh, we have so many examples how you serve your devotees in different ways. So we request that you also uh, become part of this war by driving my chariot. <laughs> so Arjuna asked him directly, and that was quite a, quite of a, a uh, you know, a strong thing to do. Ask the supreme personality to do personal service, but he, the Lord is inclined to that, so he likes to do that for his devotees. So he, he agreed to become the charioteer of Arjuna. Therefore, he was always in the midst of the battle. Um, when he was asked by Diorno why you're not going to fight, he said, I can't take sides on either side because I have affection for family members on both sides, therefore I can't fight. Because Krishna was also, you know, he was a nephew of, uh, of Kunti. Kunti was his aunt. Kunti was the mother of the Pandavas, and she was also connected to the Kurus. So Krishna was related in some ways to, and also very much friendly with many of the personalities on both sides. So Krishna decided, I can't fight. <laughs> and so Duryodhana was happy to get the armies and he walked away like he was successful. <laughs> but we understand wherever Krishna is, that's success. So I just wanted to preface that story because it's a fundamental story which leads to the whole, te the whole Bhagavad Gita or the whole battle of Bhagavad Gita which leads to Krishna here speaking the immortal worlds of Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna which are now the foundation for spirituality throughout the world. Bhagavad Gita is, deals with five subject matters. Okay, who knows the five subject matters, at least one at a time. So give me one of the five subject matters by reciting both the Sanskrit and the English translation. Ishwara, Ishwara means? The Lord. the Lord. Okay, good. Who? Huh? Prakriti, material nature. Good. Kala, Kala time. Jiva. Hmm? Jiva. Jiva, that's you. <laughs> and karma. Activities. These are the four. Which one is not eternal? Karma. Karma. Okay. Karma is not eternal. All the four other ones are eternal. 
And uh, karma is either good karma, bad karma, or no karma. All activities fall into these three categories. So there's pious activities, good karma. Impious activities, bad karma, which is called vikarma. And then you have um, akarma, which is activities that don't bring any material results. They bring results, but not material. And those results are the activities of devotional service, which are offered to the Lord. That. So that's important to understand that when we perform devotional service, we are not under the influence of the, uh, you know, prakriti. We are outside of prakriti's influence, and the results do not have reactions, material reactions. And sometimes it looks like it that way when devotees act, because devotees' consciousness sometimes are not properly, and therefore they appear to get material reactions for their activities. But it's not, because Krishna works in such a way as, as to reciprocate, as he says, As you approach me, I ward you accordingly. Even so, you're engaged in devotional service under the influence of the spiritual master, but your consciousness is material. You're not really fixed on the whole mood of devotional service. You're just going through the movements and doing the activities like it's just some part of life. But therefore, you'll get a, you, you won't get a material reaction for that, but you won't, you won't get a pure spiritual re benefit either. So what you'll get is a little understanding of where you're wrong. And that's where Krishna comes in and shows you that your consciousness is not right. And he indicates that by the results or by some, some situation that he helps you understand. And it looks like karma, but it's not karma. Okay, so I just wanted to preface this uh, talk because Bhagavad Gita is one of the uh, most popular scriptures in the world. It's even becoming more popular now as time goes on because, you know, communication is worldwide now and people have access to everything and anything in any part of the world nowadays. So now people are learning. But I also wanted to say that Bhagavad Gita, there's only one Bhagavad Gita, and that's Bhagavad Gita as it is. Because, and this is proven by the results, when Prabhupada presented his Bhagavad Gita as it is, it was obvious that people understood who is Krishna and what is the way to approach Krishna. Before then, there were many editions of the Bhagavad Gita, in fact, when Prabhupada was present, there was just under 700 editions. And I'm sure, I know when I was young, I, one day I was going through some books that were lying in a basement of my house, and I found this little tiny book called the Bhagavad Gita. It was, I think I must have been about 14 years old or something. And I just read it. It looked interesting. I don't remember anything about it. And even when I read it, it seemed nice, but I couldn't understand it. But it was just some addition some, somebody decided to put out. The Bhagavad Gita is, is, has proved that the words of Krishna cannot be really understood or explained by people who are not on the platform of pure devotional service. Therefore, there's a lot of speculation. And what they do is they go through the Gita, and Gita deals with karma yoga, it deals with bhakti yoga, it deals with jnana yoga, it deals with raja yoga, astanga yoga, different kinds of yogas. So a lot of these commentators or, you know, persons who, who take up Bhagavad Gita focus on these different types of yogas and make that the presentation. So they focus on that as the meaning of the principle of Bhagavad Gita. So you'll see today, and if you talk to people in general, especially callers, they say you can interpret Bhagavad Gita in any way you like, because there's you can take, you can use it as a karma yoga basis, you can use it as a jnana yoga basis, you can use it as a hatha yoga basis, you can use it as a a uh, bhakti yoga. So they make it, they give a wide range of uh, of uh, activities. 
Okay, so in order to get your attention, I haven't got anybody, everybody's attention yet, because there's a small group over here that are not focused yet, but we're, we're hoping you join sooner or later. <laughs> you can't, you know, you can't understand that the speaker can see everything and then knows what everybody's doing at all times, so don't try to hide. <laughs> try to stay attentive to the class, because this is this Bhagavad Gita is really, really essential to understand. And any point you can take away with you will be very helpful in your practice of Krishna consciousness. So attention is yeah. If you're going to come to class, pay attention. Otherwise, what's the use of coming? Okay, so um, we'll read from one from the first verse of Gita Mahapya. So who would like to read the translation? Or the the Sanskrit from the first one. Uh, let's see where. I don't think the first one is given. No, no, it's the second one that's given. It says Gita Dhyayana Silasya. Okay, yeah, that's the second one. The first one is. I'll read the first part. This is more like, okay, here's the first one. Gita Sastra Midam Purnyam Yapatam Payatam Pumam. If one properly follows the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, one can be freed from all miseries and anxieties of life. Bayam Sukadi Varjitam. One will be free from all fears in this life, and one's next life will be spiritual. So that's the first verse. So someone read the second verse. Gita Dhyayana Shilasya Pranayama Parasecha Naivashanti Papari Purnajatma Kirtanicha Okay, and translation? If one reads Bhagavad Gita very sincerely and with all seriousness, then by the grace of the Lord, the reactions of his past misdeeds will not act upon him. Gita Mahatmya. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're all, the living entities are suffering from the reactions of their past misdeeds. And that's why we suffer, because we've done something in the past and we're getting some reaction in the present. And so by seriously applying yourself to the reading of Bhagavad Gita, as it says, by the grace of the Lord, the past misdeeds are not, you're not, you're not disturbed by them. Next verse. <laughs> Let's see here, number three. Starts with Maline. Mala nirmochanam pumsam jalas nanam dine dine sacred gitam ritam snanam samsara mala nashanam. Okay, translation. <clears throat> One may cleanse himself daily by taking a bath in water. But if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganges water of Bhagavad Gita, for him the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Well, this is a falastuti. Falastuti means the fruits of coming in contact with and reading Bhagavad Gita. So here, one takes a cleanse. There are devotees who read Bhagavad Gita every day, the whole thing. Of course, not the purports, but the translations, they make it a vow. I mean, there's people who do it for their li the whole life, just reading the whole 700 verses a day. And so anyone who does that, and obviously, as it says, they were, are bathing in the pure waters of the Ganges. And the Ganges waters are, are uh, equipped to purify the mind, the heart, simply by connecting with the mother Ganges. So, so Bhagavad Gita is considered the waters of the Ganges. And material life is dirty. It's the lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy, fear. Uh, so many, what we say, anomalies that cover the soul. The soul is like covered by all these, uh, they call it dirts of material existence. Um, they're coverings. We, we rec don't recognize them as coverings, but they actually are. Because the pure soul, when it's freed from all these things, one can re see Krishna directly and one can, will feel unlimited happiness. So if we're not feeling happy, that means we have some 
some uh, few more showers to take <laughs> with some strong soap. <laughs> the strong soap of chanting the holy names of the Lord and reading from the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna's words in the Bhagavad Gita were very powerful. And Srila Prabhupada's presentation of Gita is, is actually was glorified by many scholars around the world as one of the most, uh, what we say, uh, exact uh, presentations of the words of Krishna. In other words, the best presentation yet. Very scholarly, at the same time very devotional. Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita was his herald by that. And uh, you'll see in a lot of of, uh, you can read the the, uh, not, what's the word critiques or comments on the Bhagavad Gita by many many people from different categories. There's hundred, there's many 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 many. We have a few that we printed out and put in the Bhagavad Gita's, but ultimately there are so many. Prabhupada has been glorified, and this our this Bhagavad Gita has sold more editions than any other Bhagavad Gita ever. In fact, if you put all the Bhagavad Gita's combined, they still don't come close to how many Bhagavad Gita's have been distributed and sold by Srila Prabhupada's devotees and read. And uh, people who come in contact with Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's uh, presentation, many of them, they take up the Krishna consciousness immediately <clears throat> because they get on it. They come into contact with the pure words coming from the pure soul on the given, the clear understanding given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So it's, it's quite fundamental that Prabhupada's Gita is so glorious. Mm -hmm. um, if you read Bhagavatam purports and if you read Bhagavad Gita purports, you'll see how more organized Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita purports are than his Bhagavatam purports. I'm not, it's not a criticism, it's just the way he presents it. It's so concise, so streamlined, so uh, consecutive. The Bhagavad Gita is just like, uh, it's, it's like a beautiful painting that Prabhupada has, has presented in the form of his purports. The Bhagavatam it's all over the place. <laughs> I mean, and Prabhupada will say something about something, and then he'll go to something else, and then he'll go to something else, and you'll find something, sometimes five or six different topics within one purport. And some of them are just slightly related. So Bhagavatam is like that, but it's not that it's any less authoritative. It's just that Bhagavad Gita is so, it's just like right there. You take one verse, one purport, focus on it, you get so much. It's condensed. It's like Bhagavatam is more like unraveled, but Prabhupada's purports and Gita are like condensed nectar, complete philosophical teachings, very, very structured and very, uh, very clear. Like that. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. Third verse. So, on, someone want to read the four, fourth verse? <laughs> Gita Sugita Kartavya Kimmanya Shastra Vistara Ya Svayam Padmana Basya Mukha Padam Vini Shrita Because Bhagavad Gita is spoken Atoito yeah, go ahead. Because Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one need not read any other Vedic literature. One need only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. In the present age, people are so absorbed in mundane activities that it is not possible for them to read all the Vedic literatures. But this is not necessary. This one book, Bhagavad Gita, will suffice because it is the essence of all Vedic literatures and especially because it is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, wonderful. It's the essence. And, <clears throat> yeah, one can become self-realized simply by reading and studying Bhagavad Gita, hearing it attentively. Um, what was I going to say here? 
Yeah, Gita, some, when, you, when you put literatures into classifications according to Vedic terminologies, you find that there's two groups here, there's Shrutis and there's Smritis. It's interesting because Bhagavad Gita is considered to be a Smriti. Smriti means commentary on the Vedic knowledge. Shruti is the knowledge directly. So the four Vedas and the Upanishads are generally the Shrutis. And the Puranas and the Hitihastras and the are called the Smritis. Smritis are actually commentators on the commentations on the Shrutis and that they're different commentators according to time, place, and circumstance. But we find that Gita is also given another title. It's called Gita, Gita Upanishad. So the Upanishads are known as the Vedas. They are the essence of the Vedas, explaining, explaining the Shrutis very clearly. So Bhagavad Gita falls within both Shruti and Smriti in one sense. It's interesting. Because some people say, well, why read the Bhagavad Gita? It's just Smriti. It's not the Vedas. But we see now, it's actually given the classification of Gita Upanishad. It's another terminology that's used to describe Gita. <laughs> okay, so, number five. Bharatamrita Sarvasvam Vishnu Vaktrat Vinik Shritam Gita Gando Dakam Pitva Punar Janma Navidyate. Okay. One who drinks the water of the Gang Ganges attains salvation. So, what to speak of one who drinks the nectar of Bhagavad Gita? <coughs> Bhagavad Gita is the essential nectar of the Mahabharat and it is spoken by Lord Krishna himself, the original Vishnu. So, this is interesting because. Um, when Bhagavad Gita was presented, um, Vyasadeva was thinking how to get people in the age of Kali to take an interest in reading Bhagavad Gita. Because people in this age are not generally philosophical. <laughs> Therefore, in order to get philosophy, uh, what we say, interesting, it's put into story form. Most people nowadays find interest in hearing things that are in, that are con connected to stories, like that, or some kind of ex something exciting. So, therefore, in order to get people to read Bhagavad Gita, Vyasadeva put it in Mahabharat. And what is Mahabharat? Mahabharat deals with a lot of intrigue, adventure romance, you know, it's like the stuff people watch on television. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's history. It's, you know, it's the, it's the history of, of greater India or the world, actually. So using that, uh, uh, what we say, trick to get people to read Gita, he put it into yeah, the Mahabharata, like that. So here it's mentioned, it's the essential nectar of the Mahabharata, spoken by Lord Krishna, the original Vishnu here. Okay, and so it says here, Bhagavad Gita comes from the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Ganges is said to emanate from the lotus feet of the Lord. So the Ganges is a combination of three waters, one from the lotus feet of the Lord. Um, the other one is coming... When uh, um, Amusan, what actually was Janava, Janava Muni, actually brought the Ganges to earth by his power and prayers. And of course, Lord Shiva took the Ganges on his head. So it's a combination of three different sources which makes up the Ganges in this realm. So it's also known as the Mandakini in the higher realms. It has different names as it flows through the universe. The Ganges comes all the way from the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu himself. That's why it says if you bathe in the Ganges, you're actually bathing in the pure waters that wash the lotus feet of the Lord. <laughs> Ganges are... Of course, there is no difference between the mouth and the feet of the Supreme Lord, but... In in impartial study, we can appreciate 
the Bhagavad Gita is mo even more important than the, the water of the Ganga. Why? Because it says the water of the Ganga can purify, but then again one can become contaminated again. <laughs> but at the same time, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, if, you, if it stays with you, will continue to bring you to higher and higher levels of purification until you become fully purified. <laughs> Like that. Okay, so do we have another reader for the next one? Sarva Panishad Ogavo, Doga Gopala Nandana, Partovatsa Sudir Bokta, Dugdam Gitam Ritam Mahat. Good. Okay. This Gita Panishad, Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all the Upanishadas ah, is just like is. a cow. And Lord Krishna, who is famous as Cowherd Boy, is milking this cow. Arjuna is just the calf, and the learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink this nectar milk of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, nice, nice a little play on how, uh, you know, the essence of all the Upanishads. And it's like a cow. So a cow he gives milk, and we have Arjuna, he's the drinker, and we are also in the role of Arjuna. We're also there to receive the nectar of the sweet milk of, of elixir, of eternal life. And that's coming from Lord Krishna, who is the cowherd boy, <laughs> who milks the cow. When was Gita first spoken? Who knows? Hmm? To who? Okay, now how does Krishna explain that? I spoke this immortal science to the sun god Vivashvan, who spoke it to his son Manu, and Manu gave it to Iflaku. So how long ago was that? Is it, huh? No, 40 million years. Let's imagine 40 million years ago. And Krishna uh, Arjuna, Krishna told us that Arjuna, you were present when I spoke it then, but you don't remember, and I do, because you change your body and I don't. Forgetfulness comes with the change of body. As soon as we change our body, we forget everything in our past life, who we were in our past life, what we did in our past life. Of course, there is a thing called, there's called Jati Smara. Jati smara means those who remember their past life. <laughs> so there, there are people who can remember their past life. Just like Jad Bharat, he remembered his past two lives. Therefore, he didn't make any mistakes. No one, what the, see, if you know your past life, you can avoid the mistakes you made in your past life. Because the tendency to commit the same mistake comes with your karma at birth. And that will also grow with you. Of course, once you take the devotional service, it no longer has that effect. But the fact is that, you know, what we did in our last life, we have a certain tendency or proclivity in this life in the same way. So I was just reading in the Bhagavatam this morning about one person who's called, his name was Ajamasana, Amjasana, Amjasana. He was the son of King Sagara, and King Sagara was the one who, um, uh, you know, his, his sons were burnt when they tried to kill uh, Kapila Muni, when Indra stole the horse for the sacrifice from Sagara's, uh, from Sagara's puja, Indra, Indra stole the horse, and the horse was brought to uh, Kapila Muni's ashram. So the sons of Sangara, one of his wife, he had two wives, Keshini and I forgot the other Le Ma Mataji's name. Uh, these 60,000 sons, they went fine looking for the horse, and they saw the horse. And when they saw the horse, uh, they thought that Kapila Muni was the person who stole the horse, so they were going to kill him. But because they immediately committed an offense by acting angrily against a, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
the fire in their body increased and they all burned to ashes. <laughs> and it was the only way they could get relief from that was to bring the Ganges water to earth. And that's, Kapila Muni says that later, to the sons of, the son of Ajamansan, who was the father of Amusa, Amsum, Amsuman. So on Aja, Am, Am, Amjusana, he was born as the son of King Sagara, but the, he acted like, like a crazy person. He was doing everything wrong in public. <laughs> and he would take young kids and throw them into deep water and they would drown. <laughs> and then uh, he would do all kinds of crazy stuff. Why? Because he knew in his last life he was a mystic yoga, yogi. And he fell down from his process of mystic yoga. So he didn't want to make the same mistake in this life. So he acted like an abaduta. But then his father got really angry at him and exiled him from, said, you should leave. You can't stay in this kingdom. So what he did was he took all the young kids that he threw in the water and brought them back to life. <laughs> And everyone was amazed by his power. He had such power. He was able to bring them back to life. And then his father regretted. But Ajama Sana, he left the kingdom anyway. He decided, I'm not coming back. And that's the last you hear about him. <laughs> he just took off. But he knew he had that Jati Smara. He had that understanding of who he was in the last life, the mistakes he made in the last life. And he was very careful to avoid those same mistakes. Because the tendency is that whatever you were in your last life, you carry some, some of those tendencies in the present life. Of course, these tendencies can change by the power of one's execution of devotional service. Your good qualities will be enhanced and your negative qualities will be destroyed like that. That's the power of bhakti. So I just thought I'd bring that up because it was, an, it was something that I was reading this morning. I found it quite interesting. Okay, so Krishna is that sweet cowherd boy who d delivers the nectar of this immortality in the form of is the words that he gives. And uh, this is compared to the most nectaring drink of milk. I don't know if you've ever had milk that's really milk. Nowadays here, maybe those of you who are what you buy in the stores is not milk. It's just white water. That's all it is. <laughs> and it's usually pretty poisonous, too. So, but if you go to our farms, some of the cows are there, and when we milk them, and the nectaring milk that you get, it's just like, you think, wow, boy, those vegans don't know what they're missing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just like celestial. <laughs> Takes you right to the spiritual world. <laughs> so, but it's very rare to get such milk nowadays. <laughs> okay, so we have one more. We have another verse, verse number seven. And this is the last one, right? Okay, who can read that one? Michael, wait for Michael to come. Okay. Ekam shastram devaki putra gitam, eko devo devaki putra eva, eko mantra stasya namami yani, karmani ekam tasya devasya seva. Read, tell me. In this present day, people are very much eager to have one scripture. One God, one religion, and one occupation. Therefore, Ekam Shastram Devaki Putra Gitam, let there be one scripture only, one common scripture for the whole world. Bhagavad Gita. Eko Deva Devaki Putram Eva, let there be one God for one whole world. Shri Krishna. Eko mantra stasya na mani, 
and one hymn, one mantra, one prayer, the chanting of his name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Karmapya ekam tasya devasya seva, and let there be one work only, the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Riva. The conclusion of all knowledge. <laughs> yeah. And it, it can work for everyone. It's not nothing sectarian about that statement. It's <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> it's 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 the best, it's most philosophical, most ecological, most sensible, and the most practical. <laughs> echo, echo, echo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, who can find a better God than Krishna? I mean, this guy is so far out. <laughs> he, he dances, he's beautiful looking, he dresses nicely. <laughs> His food, the food that he eats and he distributes, he's, cannot be compared. Uh, he's, he plays on the most sweetest of all instruments, the flute. <laughs> he's really like, I mean, he's really cool. <laughs> you can't get any, you can't get anybody cooler than him. He's the best. <laughs> Even Superman is looks bad against Krishna. <laughs> and of course, his, the chanting of his holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Ah, Java. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know, it's so sweet, so celestial, so rhythmically. So powerfully spiritualized, it's everything, the holy name, it's glorious. And let there be one service, serving the holy, serving the Lord. And you have to serve your mother, your father, your dog, your cat, your local grocery man, the, the guy down the street. <laughs> the lady up the street, <laughs> so many people to serve, you know, it's just like, you got to serve this guy and that person, this person, it's like so many service, everybody's lined up to get your service, <laughs> they just serve Krishna, forget everybody else, <laughs> yeah, it's practical, one, one service, one, one mantra, one particular personality and let there be one scripture to guide us, Bhagavad Gita, the perfect guide. Who knows the last verse in the Bhagavad Gita, what does it say? Who can recite the Sanskrit and translation? The Sanskrit is really powerful, yes? Can you recite, who can recite either one, either this? Hmm? Yatra Yoga Ishvara. Yatra Yoga Ishvara Krishna. Yatra Danudanam. Sri Budir. Juva, Juva Matir, Ma Matir Mama. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, who knows the translation? Okay, okay. Go ahead, read it. Someone. Wherever there is Arjuna, the Supreme Archer, there will also certainly be opulence, victory, extraordinary power and morality. That is my opinion. It's not opinion, it's fact. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to make it sound uh, acceptable to everyone, it's, said, it's mentioned in that way. 
So, Bhagavad Gita cannot be matched. And so we were here, we're fortunate that it falls on the Christmas day, the day that everyone celebrates. The devotees always wonder what to do on that day. <laughs> <laughs> so we have enough to do. We'll be fully engaged in reciting the Bhagavad Gita and we'll also have a nice yagya. We have the, uh, yeah, uh, we have arranged for all the information needed to perform a yagya, so that will be also part of the day's activity, a full-fledged fire yagya as part of the, so I guess, I don't know if this is appropriate, but please come. <laughs> <laughs> and take part in this great ceremony because in the benefits, the spiritual benefits cannot be calculated by just by, by being there and hearing the glories of Gita being uh, spoken. Hmm. Okay, so we'll stop here. Is there any, any comments or questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you. Um, question regarding this Gita Mahatmya. Uh, it is said that this is written by Shankaracharya. Yeah. Is the author, but we also know that Shankaracharya is also the the one who propagated Mayavada philosophy and his Gita Bhashya, yeah. his Gita Bhashya commentary on Gita is the most unwanted, unwanted thing for the Vaishnavas. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that it's like a poison, anyone who reads it will be fall down. How can we put together this contradiction, <laughs> well, some kind of apparent contradiction that one side is very like a poison and here is like a glorification of the same? You'll find within the life of Sankarachari, he, although he emphasizes monism and is known as one of the proponents of Mayavadi philosophy, he he goes back and forth. He says, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Mudha Mate. <laughs> he has said, Worship Govinda, Worship Govinda, Worship Govinda. So he talks about Govinda also. He's Lord Shiva, actually. So he had a role to play. But his Gita, his glorification of Gita in these words here are glorious enough to be placed within Srila Prabhupada's introduction to, the, to his Bhagavad Gita. Because there's no, no discrepancy in what he says. It's only a pure glorification and it's in line with the, the principles of Gita also. So we you say you can you can t take what's the what's that thing you can take gold from a filthy place. <laughs> if somebody gives you a piece of gold and you ask where it comes from, the person said, "Well, I found it in the garbage." Oh, I can't take that. No, because it's gold, it has value. So in the same way, we can take it. And, so if someone speaks who is not qualified, we, we don't really give that person the credit, but we take what they say. It has some value. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, his Gita Basya is really, like, rejected. But he was a gentleman. He, never, he didn't touch Bhagavatam. <laughs> Prabhupada says that he, he didn't touch the Bhagavatam, he was a gentleman. <laughs> I hope that helps. Maybe you'll find other answers to your question from other persons. You might want to explore that a little bit more. But this is all I can really understand. That you know, obviously it's it's acceptable because it's in Prabhupada's introduction. And there's nothing contrary in the in the in his statements. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> and one comment was on the we also studied some uh, this 
introduction to Bhagavad Gita in our Brahmachari class. And um, we also find in the Veda, Veda base there is um, three, two more versions of Gita Mahatmya. Hmm. One is from Vaishnavya Tantra Sara. It contains 85 shlokas, beautiful shlokas of glorification hmm. of uh, Bhagavad Gita. And, and one is, uh, from, I think, from Padma Purana, where Lord Shiva glorifies each chapter of Bhagavad Gita is well, own story. Yeah, that's so Parvati, that, yeah. he's speaking to um, Parvati. Parvati. Yeah, that's really nice. I ha I have that. Where the first one you mentioned? Where who spoke that one? Those eighty-five. This is uh, uh, this is in the Veda base, but it um, Shlavya Sadeo spoke this in Narang Shetra, uh, mm. and uh, Sutta Goswami. I think he's speaking to Naimi mm. to the to the sages, mm. and he speaks uh, glory of Bhagavad Gita. Yes, mm. it's beautiful, beautiful. Mm. all amazing benefits, and also curses if you don't if you don't read Bhagavad Gita. Also, is there negative mm. negative mm. inspiration is also there. Oh, good, good. <laughs> We like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> I remember I was I was subscribing to this one spiritual magazine when many years ago. This was back in the 1980s, and I came across this long uh, critique on Bhagavad Gita by one professor, and he really glorified Bhagavad Gita as the most beautiful literary. Uh, exposition on spirituality. But nowhere in his glorification did he give credit to Krishna as a, the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So I thought, well, this guy, he needs some instructions. <laughs> so I decided, I became a little upset. <laughs> so I decided to find him <laughs> and, and let him know he's off. <laughs> So I did some research. I found he was a professor at one university in in uh, in the state of Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. So I finally got his phone number. <laughs> so I I called him up <laughs> and I introduced myself and I said I really appreciated your article on the Bhagavad Gita and in this book and he was saying he was feeling good but then I said well actually you missed the main point though <laughs> the main point is um, that Krishna is the supreme personality of God and he's the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita <laughs> so then he he said well well, who are you? What's your authority? I said, well, uh, you know, I'm a member of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, so we have our understanding from our... He said, oh, you're, you're, you're Hare Krishna. He said, oh, thank you for calling. I have to go. <laughs> so he pretty much, as soon as he found out I was a, I was a member of ISKCON, he cut me off. <laughs> Because they don't want, they don't want to be limited. They think our movement is too, too, too strict, too sectarian. They want to take these scriptures and just do what they want with them, and present them in their own, you know, wrong ways. Like that. Like that. I spent, I think, 50 cents on that phone call, too. <laughs> I should have charged him for that. <laughs> All right, so we'll stop here, and then we'll continue with some more nectar from Bhagavad Gita t tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. His Holiness Chandra Maharaj Ki Jai.